What do the Russians want from this presidential election? Whose side are they on? To answer that question, we've got to ask and answer four others, I think. The first is, who are they, these Russians? What's the regime look like? Who is doing what? Who is ordering what? That's the first question. Second question is, what's their strategy when it comes to their interference? What are they doing and how are they doing it? The third question is, how are they applying their strategy to this particular event, the 2020 presidential election in the United States? And the fourth question is the most important question. How should we think about what they're doing and how should we respond, not just collectively, but as private citizens of Western democracies who want to keep their democracies? So what does the Russian regime look like? Well, I think if you don't know a great deal about Russian politics, you probably overestimate how vertical the regime is and you probably overestimate how functional the regime is. Let's take a couple of images to help us put in place very roughly how things work. Imagine a boat out at sea and the boat is called Putin. It says Putin on the boat in large letters. And indeed, there is an individual on the boat called Putin and he's wearing the captain's uniform. But he doesn't have all the powers of a captain. In fact, he shares these powers in a chaotic way with other people on the boat who input their interests into what then turns out to be the speed, the direction, the destination of the boat. So Putin is less powerful than we tend to think and his power is diminishing year by year. But what isn't diminishing is the power of Putin as a symbol and the people around him are terribly reliant on the sustenance of that power. Let's take a second image. Imagine a blend between the board of a corporation and a kind of mafia organization. And then imagine that the board doesn't have designated positions. So it doesn't have a chief executive officer and a chief uh, financial officer. It rather has people with sort of relative measures of importance that all do different things. And Putin is sort of sitting in the CEO's seat, but he doesn't really have the full responsibilities of the CEO. In fact, he just manages the quasi-suppressed conflicts that are occurring between the people at the table and between some people who are at the table and people who are close to being on the table, but not on the table. And he is basically doing his best to keep the show on the road. Now, what does this mean for the kinds of agencies that might be involved in measures against Western democracies? Well, it means that roughly these agencies will follow what the top of the regime wants them to do, but in a rather chaotic way. So a lot of what the GIU, the military intelligence might do, could be sort of improvised, quasi-autonomous, a little bit chaotic, often running on autopilot with a sort of delayed feedback mechanism to the top of the regime. So that's what we are dealing with. And so now let's move on to what strategy they're using to interfere in our democracies. What is the strategy of the Russians? They want to destabilize democracy in countries that are involved in the sanction regime against the Russians. That's it. There are two things worth adding. The first is that they're much more interested in democratic decline in your society and destabilization than they're interested in taking sides. And the second thing worth saying is that they're interested not in seeding conflicts, but at having a look at what already is a conflict, what already is a toxic thing going on inside your democracy, and then trying to stretch it out, trying to exacerbate, trying to make it worse. What are the means by which they do this? What are the mechanisms they use? If we go back to, don't mind him, if we go back to the 2016 election, we had a conversation about the Russians potentially doing three things. The first was hacking and leaking. Did we prove that the Russians did that? Yeah, we did. 
The second thing we talked about the Russians doing was social media manipulation, troll farms. Did we prove that the Russians did this? Yes, I think we have. But the scale on which they did it and the competence with which they did it and the efficacy of what they did has been dramatically exaggerated by Western journalists. Um, if you want a good read on this topic, read Thomas Ridd. Now, the third thing the Russians may have done, but we assume that they haven't because we have no evidence for it, is collusion. And that is direct contact between folks connected with him and folks connected with Trump. Now, we don't have evidence for that, but if that happened, that would be collusion. So how are the Russians approaching this presidential election? They, and this is what I hear from uh, folks with connections in Moscow, they seem to have settled on Biden. So they're not saying they want Biden to win, but they're expecting Biden to win and they have settled on that outcome. But they are getting excited about the period between when Trump supposedly loses, if he loses, and the period when he leaves office. And they hope that this period is as messy and as damaging and as destructive as possible. And they hope that Trump is able to do as much mess, as much mess as possible. Beyond that, they don't yet know how to deal with Biden. In a strategic sense, they prefer to deal with him because he's a predictable agent. They are, and of course, the they is complex, as we already said, but let's use the shorthand. They are specialists in contrived, theatrical unpredictability. But because of that, they actually, in a calculated way, want and check that the other side is predictable, because it's only if the actions of the other side are reasonably predictable that their unpredictability works. So in a strategic sense, they'll prefer Biden to Trump, arguably, but they will definitely prefer Trump to Biden as far as domestic affairs in the United States go, because Trump will undermine American democracy further, and that's what the Russians want. They want trust in politics to decline in Western countries. Now, what about the specific questions of what kind of measures or operations might be running in this election? Well, I think the political will for the Russians to, to interfere and to get involved is much diminished now compared with 2016. But we don't know what will happen because many of these operations run in a quasi-autonomous way. And a lot of things that the uh, GIU, for example, might be up to, the military intelligence, might just be sort of quasi-autonomous and autopilot driven. So just because there isn't the greatest enthusiasm for measures at the moment doesn't mean that they won't be up to stuff. So where does this leave us? Well, I have to have a cup of tea, actually. Uh, while speaking to you about this, because I'm going to say some challenging and very firm words. Um, before I do that, though, I've just realized um, you're watching a video about Russian interference by somebody who looks like they're a Russian. Um, so let me disclose that um, I lived in the Soviet Union until I was about nine years old in the 1980s. Um, my connections with Russia are real, but they're more connections with 19th century Russian literature, much less music, actually. I'm, I'm not a, the greatest admirer of Russian classical music, but uh, I, I have the greatest connection with uh, Turgenev, Alexander Hertz, and to an extent Chekhov and Dostoevsky, uh, but no political connections with contemporary Russia. Um, but I, I want to be serious, actually, and say some really strong words. Um, let me start with the less strong words, but they're still strong. So the less strong words are that we do so much damage, so much damage to our democracies when we put political pressure on intelligence agencies to exaggerate stuff about what foreign powers are doing. This creates a toxic environment in which we dramatically magnify the efficaciousness of the interference by these other states. So 
the most perfect gift we could give the Russians is not to relate to the way they're interfering factually, but to dramatize it, to exaggerate it, and to insert the exaggeration of what they're doing into our own um, political conflicts and culture wars. That's uh, a thing we really, really got to watch out because it's really the health of our democracy that's on the line. But here is the much more important thing. We have got to be honest with ourselves that what's happening across the Western world is that democracies are in decline. Not every democracy, but there is a tendency, and I'm afraid that perhaps no Western society is in the medium term immune from that tendency. It's a tendency that the Russians are interested in exacerbating, but the effect they have is the effect they have, and we've got to be honest about it. Now, you can quantify it in any way you want. I would say it's very, very minor, and very often what they do is um, spectacularly ineffective too. Um, but it's, it's not no effect, but they, they do have some effect, but we need to place that. So why is this really important? Because there is a pathology that's rife now across the Western world. It's at its worst in Washington, but it's bad in the UK as well. And the pathology is that folks who are progressives or folks who are to the left are putting down out of control right wing exclusionary anti institutional populist developments to malign interference by foreign agents. And when we do that, we fail to realize how almost the entirety of the causes of what's happening to us are internal to our societies. Now, that doesn't mean we can fix them all, but it does mean that to have any chance of partially fixing some of them, we've got to take an honest look at what's happening inside our societies and then only then um, rave on and preferably actually not rave on at all about how all of the things that are already wrong with us are being exploited and exacerbated by um, malign foreign interference. Now the way our democracies are decaying from inside and how we can um, at least try to restabilize them, how we can understand what's happening is probably about 25% of what we are discussing on this channel. So if you're new, welcome, subscribe, hit the bell notification. And if you're not watching this on YouTube, hit or press some other kind of button so that uh, we can connect and leave me a comment telling what you think about this episode and uh, maybe something about you. Gleb Pavlovsky, who was a Putin strategist until 2012, says about the current Russian regime. The Russian system of government has increasingly turned into a global leaking into, penetration, distribution, a semi-governmental, semi-private net of influence. And that is a more powerful process than what it is doing inside its own borders. Inside, it contains the population from protest. That sounds a little bit awkward because Pavlovsky said it on live television, but it conveys an important point.